welcome viewers to the series Exploring Careers in Innovation. This episode is entitled Venture Investing, Discussion About the Job and About Raising a Fund. My name is Adrian Koslick and I'm in the class of 2021 at Middlebury College and I would like to introduce this episode's guest speakers. I am joined today by Lacey Johnson, class of 2008, partner at Alumni Ventures Group and Marco Casas, venture investor at Basecamp. Marco and Lacey, thank, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm yeah really it's great to be here. Yeah, definitely. I'm really happy to meet you both and have this opportunity to chat. And just to give you a bit of context, this series explores a number of different functional areas involved in financing and growing early stage ventures. So maybe just to start off, could you both tell us a little bit about your organizations and what you each do in your role? Sure, ha happy to start. Um, so uh, as mentioned, Lacey Johnson, class of 2008. Um, I am a partner at an organization called Alumni Ventures Group. And um, we are an early stage venture capital firm um, that uh, was founded, you know, a little bit, you know, five plus years ago um, with the premise of, um, of gathering individual investors together to invest in companies. Um, so we have grown and, you know, have a couple million in assets under management at this point. And, you know, we have a very generalist mandate. So we back companies, you know, from this, you know, institutional seed stage all the way through growth. Um, and, you know, kind of try to partner with, with uh, companies for, for the long term, uh, ideally investing in sort of multiple financing rounds as they continue to find success. Awesome. Good. And then to build on that, I am not sure if you're aware, but we're actually in the same company. However, I work for the seed fund of Alumni Ventures Group, which is called Basecamp Fund. Um, my focus is specifically on seed and pre-seed stages. And there's a, there's a bit of a Middlebury story here. And I am Marco Casas, by the way, class of 2007. Um, when I was looking to make a transition into venture capital, and I came across um, Alumni Ventures Group, actually from the, it was a suggestion of, a, of another alum. Uh, I saw Lacey's profile on LinkedIn. So I reached out, we knew each other from before, but we hadn't remained close over, over the years. And uh, it was a great opportunity to reconnect. And Lacey was super uh, generous with her time. And, you know, she walked me through the organization and, and you know, helped me uh, get in, so. Yeah, no, that's awesome. It's great to hear about the Millbury Alumni Network running strong years after graduation, it's really awesome. I guess, um, Lacey, I'd like to ask, what do you enjoy most about working in the field of venture capital and particularly within an early stage venture? Yeah, I think um, venture capital is, is super interesting to me for, for a number of reasons, but I think it, it, it's kind of the first thing that I personally found that combines a lot of different uh, interests that I have. Like I really, you know, enjoy sort of analyzing businesses and sort of looking under the hood and, you know, looking at sort of how they've performed historically, but it, you know, with any sort of venture bet, it, it's pretty much a bet on the future and, you know, the particular team and their ability to execute on their vision, you know, on a go forward basis. Um, while the past is all fun to kind of analyze and see what they've done to date, you know, most promising and successful, you know, venture backed companies, you know, you know, completely iterate on their business model multiple times a year, let alone um, throughout their journey. So, you know, what you might have invested in on day one is, you know, ideally going to look much different sort of five plus years down the road as the company, you know, continues to test different theses, theses in the market and gather data and say, hey, is this working or is this not? So, um, as much as it, you know, I, I enjoy the quantitative part of it, but it's also really betting on people and sort of their ability to execute. And I just really, you know, love building relationships. Obviously, you know, in times of COVID, it's been a little harder to do that. But, you know, Zoom has been, you know, surprisingly a great, you know, platform to connect with folks and, you know, kind of continuing to kind of try to, you know, make those connections and, you know, continue to have the conversations and, you know, get to know people on a personal level. Yeah, it's great that you're still able to build those relationships given the circumstances. Yeah, I guess Marco, maybe can we can you maybe talk about how you evaluate the ventures your fund invests in and what are some of the ongoing decision criteria that you consider when making those choices? Absolutely. Um, as you can imagine, we uh, it's pretty hard to evaluate the business prospects of a, of a startup right at the 
very you know start at the idea phase we uh, invest anywhere from pre-seed as it's now called so basically just coming out of an, an angel round or even sometimes alongside angel investors so um we try to look for you know first and foremost the team uh, you know, how, how is this team and, and these founders, how are they relevant to what they're building, to the problem that they're trying to solve? Uh, and if not, because, you know, that's fair as well. What have they done to date that can show us uh, a good trajectory? You know, great. Uh, do they have, are they coachable? So those are important skills as well, because as Lacey said, it's likely that the business might not end up being what the, you know, the drawing on the back of the envelope or, or napkin was at the beginning. So, you know, there's going to be quite a bit of change. Uh, and I would say then we also look at the opportunity as well, obviously, how big is that problem? Um, if, you know, some, we can't, we're generally, so we look across sectors. So for us, it's very important to, to get deep into that uh, issue and again, making it relevant to the founder. Um, and then we also look at the context, what else is going on, the competitive landscape, whom do we think are the incumbents, you know, in the industry, the, 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 the companies that are, uh, you know, that I wanted to say the opportunity and then the, uh, the context and clearly as well the deal, right? Because if you're, then it's when we start looking at valuation and how you can tilt the odds a bit more to your favor. If you're investing at a valuation of, uh, three million dollars post let's say money um you know for you to return a venture capital type of return it's like the usual like 10x so can this company be sold you know or eventually or exit at 30 million if it's you know you, you start playing around the numbers a bit there but uh, but yeah yeah thanks for laying that out i'm sure it's um i guess from a student's perspective that sounds like one of the most interesting and probably one of the most challenging parts of the job. So it's really interesting to hear your thought process on that. I guess this kind of ties into my previous question, but maybe could you both go over how much of this evaluation is based on pure financial projections and how much is based on more like the underlying elements of the venture, such as maybe the market size, competitive position, the people involved. And I'm not sure if maybe this would be different based on an early stage venture or later stage. Yeah, I, I could start here again. I mean, uh, sorry, I left it a bit uh, raw uh, previously because I didn't want to go too much into the numbers. But yes, obviously, you you do have to look at those estimates. You at the very early stage, what we're looking for, uh, it's more of an estimate of how you're predicting the uh, the budget. How are you predicting that cash burn? Because if you're raising a million dollars, uh, we want to have clarity on on how much you know where exactly that. A spend this government is it digital marketing or is it just like you know on the teams and whatnot because it's it's much easier to calculate to make your predictions from there or projections than from the revenues you're going to collect because you're going to be testing out a lot of hypotheses as you go at the beginning and that's fine um but you know um I, i'll leave it there maybe Lacey can build on that to, to the later stages yeah, I think um, Marco Marco put it put it nicely at the early stage. It's you know as you mentioned earlier, like it's it's about the founding team and their grit and ability to persevere, as well as how much money and how much therefore how much time they have to kind of make something happen um, and have further traction. Um, where I typically get involved um, is sort of at that sort of inflection point. Um, you know, Series A is sort of where funds need to have some sort of or companies, sorry, need to have some sort of product market fit. And what that means is they need to have evidence that, you know, even in a relatively smaller population of their underlying customer base, that people, you know, want to buy, they're happy to buy, and, and the ability to find those customers is relatively efficient, um, whether that's, you know, via, you know, organic channels, aka the customers are all coming to them, or they can, you know, do, you know, they can, via various paid channels, acquire them in a way that um, is reasonable. Um, so we're very much looking for that product market fit. Um, and, and, you know, that looks different across industries. And as, you know, Marco and I are both generalists. So, you know, we do, you know, invest across, you know, various you know, industries, whether that be, you know, in consumer or healthcare or, you know, fintech, um, et cetera. So there's, there's different sort of specific metrics within each market for that. Um, for example, if something in the life sciences space, you know, they're, you know, probably working on, you know, the development of, of a drug. 
And then finding, you know, private mar product market fit and being ready sort of for that growth stage of financing, it, you know, is different. You know, they are just looking for data out of a lab that says, you know, they're their drug is a little bit more promising than it was before um, versus if you're sort of a, you know, a consumer goods company and you're sort of selling, you know, the newest like iPhone case, for, for example, you know, I need to know that certain amount of people have bought the product and, you know, you've been able to sort of, you know, find those people effectively. Um, it'd be silly if the, the product cost $10 and you were paying $10 to acquire each customer. Mm -hmm. um, so th those are the things that we're looking for at, at a very fundamental level, but we'll also dig into other aspects of the business and want to understand the overall market opportunity. And that gets becomes more and more important as you sort of get, as the companies, you know, mature and become later stage. And that's because the valuations are more expensive. So, you know, if you're investing at, in a company where, you know, it might be valued at $100 million, you need to understand, you know, what can this business become? You know, does it have sort of the underlying fundamentals to grow into a billion dollar business? Um, and that's something that we spend a lot of time time looking at because the, the opportunities to become a billion dollar business are, you know, way less than, you know, to become a hundred million dollar business. I mean, most M&A exits in the market these days are, you know, between the hundred million and $200 million range. So, you know, as you get later, like those doors might not be open anymore. So you have to understand what it can become. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's all really interesting. And thank you for sharing those insights. I'm interested in you now and learning a little bit more about both of your experiences transitioning from campus to career. So maybe to start on this section, could you start by telling me what was your major at Middlebury? And then what kinds of jobs were you thinking about pursuing upon graduation? I'm happy to start with this. Um, so I was a history major. Um, so I definitely, you know, believe in the power of liberal arts. And, you know, as much as, um, you know, people say that you'd have to have XYZ major to do something, like I'm not wholeheartedly convinced. Yes, I mean, at some point you need to be, you know, go take pre-med classes if you want to go to med school, but you can even do that after Middlebury. So <laughs> other than that, you know, I think, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty wide open, um, but, you know, I, in terms of career paths on campus, so I, um, you know, kind of fell pretty early into the, the, the path of doing just on-campus recruiting. And again, this is like 2006, 2007, when, when times are a bit different, and ended up getting um, a summer internship uh, at Goldman Sachs for my junior, you know, the, the summer between my junior and senior year, and then joined full-time, um, you know, after graduation. So I was pretty focused on finance in general. You know, I, you know, candidly, I didn't really know what that meant. Um, I wasn't really sure about that. I think I just sort of other, you know, it seemed interesting. I liked, you know, learning about, you know, lots of different industries. So it seemed like a good place to start. So that's kind of, that was my path. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I second what Lacey said about the liberal arts. I. I, yeah, it took me a, a, a few years to figure out, even at Middlebury, what I wanted to do. Um, I was a political science major and I minored uh, in Russian language and literature. So I had this like language aspect to my career and I wasn't sure that I wanted to use uh, Russian at all, to, to be quite frank, because I come from South America and, and I was a United World College um, kid as well. So I, I thought I was going to go into foreign service or some sort of international, uh, you know, oriented career. And then senior year came about and I freaked out. I did not do an internship. Uh, I was at Middlebury both summers junior for uh, language school or, like, you know, and then the last one, I just stuck around because I liked summer there so much. Um, I was working at the library and I just kind of like read a lot and, and I was trying to actually started the career search then again, a bit late. Uh, and what happened was there was a, an international bank uh, that it's called Renaissance Capital and they were focusing on Russia and Africa. So I was very lucky that those were two regions that I knew well. And I feel like it was a backdoor into finance in a way. Um, and I ended up doing investment banking in Moscow for my first year. And then I switched to uh, institutional sales, which I was in a sales and trading desk for the next 10 years uh, between um, New York, I, did, I went back to Moscow for a bit and then I was in, in Johannesburg for some time in, in Southern Africa. So very uh, emerging markets oriented. And then um, what happened was I, I tried to start a pivot um, very consciously because I, I was very, 
uh, how do you say, like I would say, it, it was contagious to see all the innovation that was going on and technology. And I went and did an executive MBA and yeah, switched to venture. And, you know, if I can say anything about pivoting, I think the important thing here is that, or like, you know, starting on a new path is that I had to, um, I, I had to start switching the narrative about my career. And a lot of that, you know, it takes shape on LinkedIn these days. It takes shape on like the, through the people that you're talking to. So a lot of informational interviews um, and then doing things towards that. So I made a couple of angel investments and then, you know, that gets you a bit closer to, uh, to that conversation during interviews and, and whatnot. So um, I'll stop there, but yeah. Yeah, thank you both for sharing. I'm always, it's also always super cool to hear about alumni's paths, uh, I guess, from graduating from Middlebury to later on down their career. So I think it's really awesome that you're able to switch around in several sub-industries within finance and move on eventually to venture capital. Um, Marco, I'd like to ask, I think since a lot of Middlebury students pursue fields like investment banking and sales and trading right after graduation, I'm curious to learn about how your background in those two fields help prepare you for starting out in venture capital later on down the road. Sure, and look, it's, it's, it's highly relevant. I think in investment banking, you, you get the discipline of, of researching an industry and companies and doing an analysis. So that's, that's very important. Um, and then in sales, I think you get the other part and it's people and networks um, and being able to leverage that. Um, there is a very, and you know, Middlebury, I'll just link it back and, and pass it on to Lacey, but there was a book that I read as I was thinking about switching to investing. And it's, uh, I believe the name is Investing the Last Liberal Art. And, and uh, I think it's Robert Hackstrom or something. Yeah, that he wrote it anyway. And, and here he just puts investing through the mental models of different disciplines. And it made me think about Middlebury. Obviously this is like only a few years ago and I've graduated a, a while ago. So it, it reminded me of, of that training from campus to you know, your career. Um, and yeah, but, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, thank you. I guess, at least you had mentioned that you also had worked at Goldman Sachs following, um, I guess, the summer between your junior and senior year, and that you would work there full time after graduation. So, since Goldman is definitely one of the largest, most prominent banks on Wall Street, maybe could you talk about the comparing and contrasting of the culture and dynamic between a large bank and then your current company? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question and, and one that, you know, I definitely couldn't have answered just looking at them. Um, you know, I think my, you know, Goldman Sachs was a 30,000 plus um, person, you know, entity, you know, I, it, you know, it was a well oiled machine, you just, you know, and you sort of take for granted some of the benefits and, and perks and training and resources that, that you might have, um, you know, while you're there, because it's kind of like, you don't know anything else. Um, and leaving Goldman and, you know, I had a couple of different stops after that. I went to business school, then worked at JP Morgan for a little bit, then best investment office, and now at Alumni Ventures Group. Um, you know, moving from, you know, such large organizations to small. I mean, I joined Alumni Ventures Group when we were only 20 people, and now we are over 100. But it, it's tiny in comparison. I think, you know, you have to be a little bit scrappier. I mean, I think, you know, you wear lots of hats that maybe, you, you know, weren't necessarily, you know, called upon you to, to wear and you, you sort of know tasks too small, you know, when you kind of go to a, a smaller, you know, organization that's still sort of finding its way and figuring it out. Um, uh, so I would say, you know, one of the key things of, you know, any sort of job search is sort of figure out what works for you. But, you know, there's a couple of different vectors that, that you need to figure out is like the actual domain of like what you're doing interesting. You know, do you like working at a big company? Um, and, you know, what type of like underlying like culture are you sort of looking to kind of be a part of? Um, so I think, you know, one of the great things about working for a big company and a small company is like it gave me perspective and gave me, you know, a, you know, different viewpoint of which to view like what I might be looking for now or in the future. I think, you know, I'm definitely a smaller company kind of person. And, you know, it wasn't something that I knew until I sat in my current seat that, oh, this is this is probably for me and for my my skill set rather than kind of working at a larger organization. But I definitely think, you know, working in a small company is not for everybody. And I always say that, you know, when you're getting your first job or thinking about it, you know, the best thing that can come out of it is data. So you can learn what about it that you might like and what about it you might not like. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think definitely for seniors, juniors, and like people starting out early in their careers, like recently graduated, it's definitely a process of figuring out what kind of culture, what kind of dynamic is right for us. And it's definitely a multi-year process. Maybe it'll take a few companies and a few different career paths. But I think, yeah, it's definitely something that's really interesting to figure out along the way. Discussing advice you might have for current students. Could you maybe advise us on how to best prepare ourselves for entry points into early stage ventures? Yeah, um, you know, I will say that, you know, in thinking about the venture ecosystem, I think it's one of the more unique um, subsets of finance in general, as in, you know, there is no one background that will make people successful. And I think that's important. And I think that's an you know, definitely representative of the folks that kind of have risen and created, you know, careers in, in the space, and then also of the, the incoming, you know, people that are sort of uh, entering it today. Um, you know, and I also think that, you know, venture firms are usually relatively small, you know, compared to, you know, the Goldman Sachs's of the world. And, you know, the, the teams are looking for, you know, diverse, um, you know, points of view. And I think that, you know, having somebody who has a banking background is great, but you don't need five of those people, you know, so it's sort of they're looking to assemble their puzzle piece of folks that can kind of, you know, really, um, you know, challenge opinions and, and look at markets in a different way. Um, so I, you know, I'm hesitant to say that there's one background, but I would say that, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, what might be helpful to sort of build your skill set in order to join a venture firm, I would say, you know, it's just finding, you know, getting some sort of experience and, you know, learning the skill sets that, you know, make that job successful and kind of being scrappy and learning, you know, the basics of, you know, what makes someone like good at showing up at work and like doing those jobs. I mean, there are definitely pluses of going, you know, to a large bank and doing the training program because they're fantastic. But in this day and age, you can kind of get that training in a lot of different places, even like online for free. Uh -huh. um, and sort of if you join the early stage startup right out of school, you're getting an experience of building and kind of, you know, being able to create and learn, you know, you can empathize with your founder so well because you're like, hey, I, I was there. I, I understand what it's like to kind of grow a company from, you know, two people to 20. You know, I was part of that. Um, so it, it, there is no two, you know, there's no cookie cutter mold. I know that that's almost like the hardest, um, you know, part of this industry is that, you know, joining banking for better or worse, there's a, you know, a checklist of things to do. And it's a very structured and regimented process um, versus venture is, is a little bit less so. So Marco, I'm curious to hear in your opinion, what do you think are the most important skill sets required to have a successful career in venture capital? Great, uh, great question. And, you know, it goes a bit back to what I was saying earlier about, uh, you know, the analytical skills. So mm -hmm. that's important and that's something you can get across disciplines, you know, the ability to research an industry, to research a company well, who are the main competitors. That's all very important. And then there's another skill that is, um, you know, it's something we get at Middlebury. It's a soft skill. It's people skills, networking skills. And that is important because in venture, um, I've found more than in other careers that I've been involved, you really need to be able to show that you can leverage your network to get into the best deals that you can. Um, also use the same, well, use your network as well to help the company once you've made an investment. And then also, you know, when it comes to vetting companies as well, somewhere in the middle of that process, you also go, um, I was talking to a founder in quantum computing and I reached out to one of my friends from my class who does that at one large bank. And in fact, he may be speaking in one of the, uh, you know, uh, episodes that we have for, for this um, series. But in any case, if you leverage those, it's, uh, you know, it makes quite a good uh, skill set. Okay, yeah, that's great advice, thank you. Uh, Lacey, I'm interested to hear about what your advice you might have for current Middlebury students, particularly seniors, who are in the process of searching and applying for their first job after graduation. And I guess this could be related to venture or just any type of job in general. Yeah, I would say just like, don't let the like, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up mantra, like kind of get in the way. Um, you know, you just got to get started and you got to get going somewhere. Um, and any job that you take, like, you know, have it, try to have it be something that you're excited about. 
but it is, you know, again, a chance to get data on what you like and what you don't like. Um, I think, you know, there's this old adage that like, you know, whatever you, you do, you sort of, you know, setting the stage for the future. And it's like, no, no, you are in the driver's seat to set the stage for the future. Um, you know, you just have to kind of be, take an active role along the way. And, and so I guess like, you know, whenever, whatever job that you find yourself in and, and you're excited about it, like don't stop networking as you go. And I think like, you know, as you, if you're just sort of endlessly curious about finding what's right for you, um, you know, you'll, you'll find something over time that works quite well um, and, and be happy along the way. I think if you're trying to focus on like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Like, you know, heck, like, I don't know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I don't know what anybody who knows what they're going to do. So, you know, just that would be my one advice if I could kind of go back to my own shoes, you know, at, you know, as a, as a student at mid to just yeah, yeah, focus on, on the present. <laughs> that's very helpful. And I like what you said about the driver's seat. It's very encouraging, empowering. Yeah. yeah. I guess just to round off this section, I'm interested to hear um, your thoughts on what role, if any, do you think advanced degrees would play in the venture capital space? I know you both had gone to business school. I was wondering, is this pretty normal for the venture field? I would say it's, it's not unheard of, but it's not like required. Um, I would say advanced degrees all over the board, you know, can be helpful in certain ways. You know, a lot of different venture firms have very specific, um, they invest in very specific domains. Um, so, you know, if you want to invest in life sciences, like you have to have some sort of underlying understanding of that ecosystem. And many of those, you know, practitioners and professionals have, you know, whether it's, you know, go to med school or, you know, have a, some sort of PhD or higher degree in, in the underlying domain. And that is super helpful to how they assess those businesses. Um, you know, similarly, if, you know, if you do any sort of deep tech investing that requires, you know, understanding of, you know, AI or, you know, ML or even quantum computing, you know, it's hard to kind of do all that, you know, without, um, you know, a particular degree. But, you know, I would say, you know, for the most part, you know, not necessarily required, you know, an MBA for me was just like a helpful way to kind of sharpen a lot of my skills about thinking about strategy and thinking about sort of, you know, big picture analysis of businesses. Um, and it's also a way for me to build my network, it, you know, it, on top of, you know, all the fantastic network that, that it has, but it's definitely not something that is a requirement for the business. Yeah, I would agree with that. And especially right now, there are even more programs that are joined in a way. There's like an MBA with, you know, data science components and whatnot, you know, and I would just look at specifically what it is about the program you would like to do that resonates with your interests, uh, uh, you know, as Lacey was saying. Um, I did my MBA fairly late in my career, but it was an executive program. So it was part time and I chose a global program. So it was very aligned with what I wanted to do. And, and I also made sure that it was heavy on early stage finance and entrepreneurship and startups. So, it was a way to get that transition going from where I was. So it, it was a very clearly defined from point A to point B and it worked out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think, yeah, currently, especially as seniors, I think some of us are really thinking about even not only what job to do, but further on down the road, if an advanced degree such as an MBA law school or another type of degree would be down the road. So this is definitely all really good advice. So thank you. That's all the questions I had. So I just wanted to thank you both again for taking the time to talk with us and for sharing your experiences and helping Middlebury students prepare for their first career destinations. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this was great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. And so this really this concludes this episode within the series Exploring Careers and Innovation. So in closing, I just wanted to encourage viewers to tune in to get more career perspectives and advice from a number of professionals in a broad variety of organizations and our other episodes in the series. And I also want to encourage viewers to tune in to the other MidVantage series, which can be accessed through the events and programs tab on the CCI website. So yeah, thanks again for everyone for watching and especially thank you Marco and Lacey for participating and for taking the time.